just a couple weeks, Devin and I will be uh, celebrating a special day in our relationship. Uh, it's not our wedding anniversary, but June 5th, 2004, was the day that we started officially dating. And um, it's easy to remember because it's 06, 05, 04. And so this will be 17 years since uh, she agreed to let me call her. And um, the interesting thing was that at that time, I was in seminary in Virginia Beach, and she was here. She grew up in this area. And so we were doing the long distance dating thing for many, many months. And so all we had was email, AOL, instant messenger, and the phone. And so from that time on, uh, things got serious. We moved from instant messenger to actual phone calls. And so um, we spent a lot of time on the phone. I was deeply, deeply in love as I still am. And we were on the phone every minute that we possibly could be. And I will even say that we would fall asleep on the phone together. Yes, it was pretty sappy. And so that first month was just dating long distance bliss on the phone. And it was all bliss until Verizon sent me a little piece of mail. I was so in love, I had no thought of what this was going to cost me. Now, for those of you that have gotten a cell phone in the last 10 years, this is completely irrelevant to you. Back in the day, like, the unlimited plans were like nights and weekends, like after seven or nine o'clock at night, then it was you could talk as much as you want. And I don't even remember what plan we were on, but it was not a plan that included extra minutes because my bill was like $300, 17 years ago. That's a lot of money for a grad student. <laughs> and so uh, maybe you've had a situation in your life where it was time to pay the piper, if you know what I mean. A um, mm, couple years ago, we went to a, on a quick trip to Chicago one night, stayed in a hotel, and there was no parking lot around, and so you just, you get valet, I guess. And so I didn't think anything of it. I didn't ask how much it was. It was like, one night, what could one night cost? I was like, 15, 20 bucks, no problem. I get the bill in the mail. It's like $75. It's like, oh, man. When you were a kid... Uh, and kids, again, right now, this isn't as much of a deal. When I was a kid and, and, like, we would go out to dinner after church or something, it was a big deal. You had to ask, are the refills free? Because a restaurant would stick it to you. Like, kids, we'd be going through soda, and then, like, $40 later, it's like, it wasn't free refills. And so my parents would always ask, is it free refills? Or maybe you would remember when you turned 18, you got some mail. Or maybe it was when you went off to college and Capital One started hitting you up or whatever credit card company it was. And like, you're 18 now, sign up for this credit card. We'll give you a free Frisbee. You're like, I want the Frisbee. I'll sign whatever you want me to sign. And you get that credit card and it's like, dude, free magic money. All I got to do is swipe this thing and I can get whatever I want. And maybe some of you are still paying that off because your day will come. Am I right? And so maybe already you, you like situations are popping up in your mind where you're like, I thought that was free or I didn't think it was going to cost that much or the day of reckoning came. Well, Peter today is going to talk about the day of the Lord in this passage. Uh, it's something that the prophets throughout the Old Testament and then Jesus and the apostles all speak about too in the New Testament. The course of human history is leading to a day that the Lord has set on his calendar when Jesus will return, and every man, woman, and child who has ever lived will stand before him. It will be time to pay up. Ecclesiastes 11.9 says this. It says, young people, it is wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. That's what we're going to talk about today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for what we have already heard, what we have already prayed, what we have already sung. And now, Lord, as we open your word uh, to go through what you inspired Peter to write down, not only to those churches 2,000 years ago, but to this little church meeting in Avon, Ohio in 2021. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that, 
that one of your jobs is to help us to understand the truth of God's word. And so we ask that you would do that today. You would open our hearts to receive the seed of the word. You would open our ears to hear it and our minds to understand it. Jesus, do your thing and form us more into your image today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. If you need a Bible, we have a stack of them in the back. They will be there every week for you to grab. You can use it while you're here. If you need a Bible at home, take it. It's our gift to you. But like I say every week, I want you to follow along with me so that you see God's word for yourself. The 2 Peter chapter 3. This is the last chapter in this book. And this is what Peter writes. He says, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. And so he's basically saying, like, guys, you know I love you. I wrote you that first letter, and now I'm writing to you again. I want to remind you. I want to stir you up. Basically, I want to kick you in the pants in a good way. Like, you got to remember these, these things. you got to know these things. And then he says, I want to remind you of these things that the prophets said and also the apostles. Well, what's he talking about? Verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. So in other words, haters going to hate, scoffers going to scoff. It's what they do. And you need to know that they're coming. They'll follow their own sinful desires. In chapter 2, a couple weeks ago when we went through, we talked about the false teachers. And so obviously these scoffers are also some of the false teachers. False teachers are the scoffers. And others involve people who scoff at the word of God. And he's like, you've got to know that their motivation and what they scoff at, the motivation and the false teaching that they're presenting you with, their motivation is their own selfish desire. He covered that a lot. He covered their greed, their sexual immorality, that they were living primarily for their own passions. And so Peter's like, you've got to remember this. And then he says, they're coming in the last days. We're going to hit pause for a second on this passage how many of you know that our culture, secular and Christian, has this huge fascination and even preoccupation sometimes with the end of the world, right? So many comic books and books and movies and TV shows and social, social media, is, it's always like, what's it going to be like when the apocalypse comes and Armageddon and the zombies and all of that? It's like, Huge, like what's it gonna be like? How's the world gonna come to an end? Is somebody just gonna push a big red button and it's gonna go? Pfft. We wanna know. People wanna know how and what and when is this gonna happen? When are the last days? And this question gets raised whenever we face uh, some sort of crisis, right? Whether it's wars or disease or natural disasters or political upheaval or financial issues, what's the first thing we go to? Oh, this is the last days. It's here, it's coming. I knew it, it's here, it's here. No more playing around. Now we gotta get serious because this is the last days. You don't have to raise your hand, but are you with me? I've been on the planet four decades and in my short time, this just keeps happening. People writing books. When I was eight years old, it was 88 reasons Jesus is coming back in 1988. Dude missed it and wrote another book. And it keeps happening, right? People wanna know when is Jesus coming back? Are these the last days? Days And how many of you know that this last year has been no different? No different. People are saying, surely this is it. Look around you. It's happening. Let's lose our minds. Jesus is coming back. And so the question is, are we in the last days, Matt? Tell me, Pastor, are we in the last days? I'm going to do us all a favor. I'm going to help you out today. I'm going to be so clear. I'm going to finally and definitively answer the question, are we in the last days? You know what the answer is? Yeah. We are. And we have been for 2,000 years. What? How do you know that? Acts chapter 2. Maybe coming in today, you didn't realize this, but on the Christian calendar, like the, the rhythms of, of the Christian church universal and what we celebrate today is considered the Sunday of Pentecost, 
where we celebrate and remember the coming of the Holy Spirit like Jesus promised on the day of Pentecost. It was a Jewish festival and feast that happened 50 days after um, Passover. And so Acts chapter 2 tells us that the church was together that morning, the, the early church. Jesus had ascended, and so they're kind of freaked out, and he said, wait in Jerusalem for the Spirit I'm going to send. Like, don't, don't try to do anything till I give you the power from on high. And so they're huddled in that upper room. And then the sound of a rushing wind fills the place. And then like tongues of flaming fire appear on their heads. And then they start speaking in other languages, speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit fills them. And because it was this huge festival, this huge annual festival, there were Jews from all of the known parts of the world, from all different languages that were in Jerusalem. And so as the Christians flood the street that they're speaking in tongues, people are looking around at each other like, how are they speaking in my own native language? Like, how do they know my language? And they were proclaiming the gospel in their language. And so people are starting to freak out. Like, how is this happening? And some of them are like, man, these people are drinking. They're drunk already. And Peter stands up that day and listen to what he says. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel, like 600 years before this. And then he quotes the prophet Joel. This is what the prophet Joel wrote 600 years before. And in the last days it shall be. Peter says, this is what Joel was talking about. So in other words, this is the last days. In the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. There's the day of the Lord. The great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That day Peter said, Hey, church, the last days start now. The time that Jesus ascended back to the Father until he comes again are the last days. And we will know war, we will know pestilence, we will know all kinds of natural disasters because we are moving toward the day that the Lord has marked on his calendar that Jesus will return. Amen? So are we closer now to Jesus returning than we were yesterday? Absolutely. Are we closer now to Jesus returning than we were back in 1988 when we missed it? Yes. But don't get all freaked out. This whole last 2,000 years has been the last days. We are awaiting the return of Jesus, and everything's going to be getting crazy as we wait for him. Okay. Let's go back to our text, verse 4. And Peter directed... Oh, I'm still in Acts. I've got to turn back. Wrong verse 4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Again, this is the scoffers. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Oh, so this is the issue that Peter's reminding them of and warning them about. These scoffers are saying that Jesus isn't going to come back. He's like, don't let them fool you. These false teachers, these scoffers are denying that Jesus will return. And they're saying, look, nothing's happening. Like, look throughout history. Nothing's happening. Even back to our forefathers, just generation after generation comes and goes. God doesn't intervene. Nothing happens. How many of you know that our world today pushes the same message that this is all we got? Live and let live. Be you. Eat, drink, and be merry. Get good grades. Get into good college so you can get a good job, so that you can make good money, so that you can have the good life. This is it. Live it up. Do whatever you want. Get whatever you can. Satisfy your desires, your pleasures, and your comfort. You know what? Go ahead and throw that party this weekend while your parents are away. They'll never know. Some of you know that doesn't go so well. 
the scoffers are saying, you Christians, pfft, he's not coming back. He hasn't come back for hundreds and hundreds of years. Live like you want to live. Verse 5, for they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. God created everything that is. He brought land out of water, separated the waters by land by his word. They forget that. They overlook it on purpose. Verse six, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So he's referring back to the flood like he did in chapter two, like, uh, guys, uh, yeah, he has intervened. God does bring justice. He's brought it before. Verse seven, but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Fellas, judgment day is coming. Christ will return. Now, back in Genesis, he promised that he wouldn't destroy the world with water again, but this time it will be fire. And when you read about fire throughout scripture, over and over again, uh, it's used not just for destruction, but it's used to purify, to burn away all that is sinful, wicked, impure, and broken. And when you look at the intentionality of what he just said, like, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept, intentional, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The Lord has a date on his calendar that is set and has been set from eternity past where he will return and set things straight. Verse 8. They intentionally overlook this. But in verse 8, Peter says, but you implied, you do not overlook this one fact. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. He's basically quoting Psalm 90 verse 4. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What he's saying is that God is not bound or pressured by our sense of time. Have you noticed that yet? Oh, Jesus, I need to hear from you tonight. We need a check tonight. God, help me get through this. Why won't you just fix this? I've been praying for 20 years. God is not bound or pressured by our sense of time. He is not slow to respond. He can't be. He is always on time. He is never late. He is never early. He is not behind schedule on your sanctification or on mine. He is not behind on bringing justice. Everything goes according to his plan and what he ordains. And so you look around and it's like, well, the pace of humanity is speeding up. Come on, Lord. Like now we have the internet, we've got, we can get across the world in hours. We have instant communication, instant information. We almost have instant food delivery now thanks to COVID. Everything is almost instantaneous for us. God is unfazed. God can and does do profound things in a moment. But I've, I've found that more often he works over longer periods of times. He is pleased to work over generations and generations and protracted amounts of times, fulfill, fulfilling his plan. A day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. He's got the day set. He's got it under control. And so that last part. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now, this verse is often used to teach universalism, which is the belief that, hey, in the end, everybody gets saved because it says it right there. 
He doesn't want anybody to perish, so he's going to save us all. But that does not line up with the rest of Scripture. And when you really look at this verse, who's he talking to? He says, the Lord is patient toward you. Who's the you? Who has he written these two letters to? He's writing to the church. He's writing to faithful followers of Jesus. He's like, the Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any implied any of you should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's writing to those that the Father has chosen that maybe have not submitted to him in faith yet, but over and over again, the scripture makes it clear that the Lord knows the who, those who are his. He selected them from before he created anything. Jesus said, I have not lost any of those that you have given me. The Lord has appointed all those who will be saved. And as soon as the last one responds in faith, all right. Think of how many believers have been brought into the kingdom since 1988. It wasn't time yet. The Lord had other people that he had ordained from eternity past. They're mine. It's not time yet. He is patient toward you. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now some argue that you have theologians kind of in, in two camps and some in the middle. Some argue that when they read this passage, like Peter's being very figurative and like the Lord is not going to burn away everything into oblivion and annihilation. He's not just going to completely destroy the earth like the Death Star blew up on Star Wars. And then others say um, he is going to blow everything up and new heavens, new earth like it's a replacement. And the others say, you know what, he's going to renew what's here, and it's going to be new in that sense. And I think when you look at the bulk of Scripture and the balance of it, and, and the more and more you look at what's written, and you can go to 1 Corinthians 15 and other places, it's really like Jesus' resurrection body. When Jesus rose from the dead, did he look completely unlike he did as he walked the earth? No, he was still in the form of a man. They recognized him once he let him. He was Jesus. He could still eat fish. He had breakfast with them. He walked around. He talked. And yet his body was glorified. It had a shadow of what was before, but he was also completely changed. And so it's often called like there's discontinuity. Like he's not totally the same, but there's continuity. And he says that we're going to be changed like he was. And so I think as you read through scripture, there's a renewal of the earth that's going to happen. Like what is here now and what has been broken by sin is going to be burned away. All of the stuff that we have pursued with our lives, all of the fame and, and the money and the possessions and all of that, it's going to be burned away. The brokenness of creation will be burned away and the new will come. And he's going to speak about that in just a second. But he says... The works that are done on it will be exposed. Acts 17, 31, and I think it's going to be on the screen, says this. It says that he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. You're like, well, what man is that? Love this next phrase. And of this he has given full assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That's the man. That's the man he has appointed. Jesus is the one who will judge the world on the day that he has chosen. Jesus himself in Matthew 24, he said this. He said, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. A few verses later, he says, therefore, you also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. There is a day that Jesus will return, where we will stand before him. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Almost done. Verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, there it is again, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. 
He's saying, keep going. Your life now matters. Don't just live for your pleasure because all of that is going to burn away. Live in light of eternity. Continue to pursue the Lord. Jesus is coming back. And we get to partner with him in what he's doing. He is waiting. He is patient because he's got others he wants to bring in. We don't know who they are, but he does. And he says, you get to be part of that. So continue to allow the gospel to transform your heart and to propel you in love to those around you so that they can be brought in. You speed the day of his coming. In the last verse, verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, this isn't the only place that the Bible talks about a new heavens and a new earth. Revelation 21, which we're going to read in a second, isn't the only place that the Bible talks about a new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah, I believe in 64 and 66, talks about the Lord is going to send a new heavens and a new earth. John 14, this is just hours, the night before Jesus is crucified. This is, uh, uh, he's sitting with his disciples. He says this, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He's preparing something new for us, friends. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Friends, that's the day that we are longing for. That is the day that the wicked will find absolutely terrifying. But for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, it is a day that we look forward to with great anticipation and longing and hope. And so while we are in the last days, there is no need to fear. There is no need to fear. The Lord has this. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. The Lord knows exactly when he's returning. The Lord knows exactly those who are his, and he has you in the palm of his hand, and nothing can take you out of it. Would you pray with me? If you're here today and you have not had that assurance that you're going to be okay when Jesus comes back. The whole reason he came the first time was, of love, was out of love because you and I didn't have a prayer of standing before him and spending eternity with him. Apart from him, you and I are absolutely under the judgment and destruction for the punishment of our sin for all eternity. Jesus took that on the cross and he invites you today to turn to him and to repent. And so if you've never done that, he's inviting you to surrender your life and say, Lord, would you forgive me of my sin? Would you fill me with your spirit as you did on that day of Pentecost? Would you change my heart? Would you change me from the inside out? Lord, would you give me such a hope and an anticipation of your return and not a callousness or even a fear of it, God? And Father, for those here who do know you, uh, Lord, I pray that the words of Peter, inspired by your spirit, would encourage us today. 
that as we see our culture and the world around us shaking and trembling, those birth pains of, of awaiting your return, Lord, and we see things crumbling around us and things becoming more hostile, Lord. It's so easy, like Peter walking on the water, to take our eyes off of you and to begin to freak out. Well, Lord, we thank you for the reminder today that you have all these things in your hands, that you have the day marked. And because of the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus, we can rest assured that you've got us in your hand. Lord, may that propel us to keep pursuing you, to keep going in the way that you've marked before us. We love you, Jesus. Amen.